We're going to use one verse today. 2 Samuel, <clears throat> verse 16. I mean, chapter 16, verse 7. When God looks at us, He looks beyond our outside. He looks to the inside. When Jesse told Samuel to pick, to anoint someone to take his place, out of Jesse's family, God told him to take it out of Jesse's boys, who would be the next king. So the priest brought in their boys, started with one and said, no, I don't think that could be the right one, and went on. And then in verse 7 it says, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance of the, of the height of his stature, because I have rejected him, for God sees as a man sees, God does not see as a man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And that's what I'm going to speak about today, the heart. How God looks at our heart. Part of the problem we live in in this world is prejudice. And we're all prejudiced toward other people. Some, somewhere, somewhere along the line, we're prejudiced. Some people are prejudiced against short people, tall people, skinny people, fat people. A lot of people are prejudiced against me because I'm bald. But it, it's one of those things that we live with because we look at the outward. And that's part of the problem in the world. That prejudice against so many different things. Race, culture, background, all those things. But God looks at the heart. What us, I want us to think about what does God see in your heart? See in you. See your heart. And that's what I want us to think about today when I start my sermon. Father, this is your sermon. You gave it to me. You put it on my heart that I may speak your word in truth and in spirit. And in spirit, I pray for the Holy Spirit to come upon me, to wrap his loving arms around me and speak through me, that the words that I say would be for your glory, for your honor and to help people to understand how you love us. And I give you thanks for what you're about to do. In Jesus' name, amen. The first thing I want us to think about is having a clean heart. God wants us to have a clean heart. How do we get a clean heart? Through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. A cleansing that comes into our life Psalm 51, 4 and following, David comes confessing his sin. That's the first thing we have to do. If we, if we are going to be saved, the first thing we have to do is recognize we have sinned. And David said, I have sinned against you and you alone, God. He knew that he was a sinner and he needed help. That's why we come to God, because we are sinners. All, every one of us have sinned to come short of the glory of God. And in order for us to meet God, we have a have a cleansing of life, a cleansing heart. A heart that, that is free from the sin of for unforgiveness. A heart that is free from sin. And God does the searching. In Psalm 139, 22 and 23, it says, God searches our heart to see where we're at, what we're at, what our heart is like. Sometimes we need to search our heart. See where we stand with God in our heart. Understanding. And then, there's 
is seeking for forgiveness. When David came to, to God, he, he came forgiving, asking forgiveness in verses 10 and 12 of Psalm 151. Come, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with your willing spirit. A restoration. Sin has separated us from God. And now, through the, our asking and seeking forgiveness, we come to God and say, create in me a new heart, a cleansed heart, a heart that is clean, a heart that would be pleasing to you. You can only get to heaven with a clean heart. You can't get to heaven with a dirty heart. There is a restoration of salvation. Sometimes we, we drift away from our joy of salvation. We start doing things that we shouldn't. And David drifted away a long way. Adultery, murder, all those things. But he still was a man after God's own heart. And God cleansed him and made him do it. Second thing, more than just a clean heart, but a pure heart. Matthew 5, 8 says, Blessed is the man who is pure, for he will receive God. He will see God. How wonderful is that? A pure heart will see God. I don't know about you, but my sinuses are draining, so... <laughs> Draining from the nose of my eyes. That way I can do. And then I left home and left my glasses. They're, they're good. They're still on the table, and I'm sure they still work, but they're not working right now. But in Psalm, in, in Psalm 24 14, it says that we must have a pure heart, a heart that is one of integrity, respectable. One that God sees in us something good, kind, precious. One who is honest, pure. One, most of all, who is righteous. righteous come, righteousness comes from Jesus Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, he took our righteousness, which is but a rags, and made us clean, made us new, made us pure in his righteousness. Standing, right standing before God. We had that presence with us. Forgiveness, living a life full of love and joy. Christ is with us. He lives in us. In Galatians 3.20, it says, It is not I that live, but Christ who lives in me. That makes a pure heart. When Christ lives in you, you have a pure heart because he is perfect. He is pure. He is clean. And there's a heart of mercy. Matthew 5.7 says, The merciful, blessed be the merciful, and they shall receive mercy. Mercy means giving yourself away, thinking more of the other person yourself. A heart that is full of forgiveness. You know, God says, when you forgive, <coughs> you're forgiving. And he says, you must forgive or I won't forgive you. Now, that's pretty tough, folks. That's some strong talk. When God says, if you don't forgive, I won't forgive you. We must have that forgiving heart, a heart that does good to others, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, 
visiting the sick, lifting people up, doing good. That's a merciful heart, a heart that expresses love to others, even when they don't deserve it. How many times have you met people that you didn't think they deserved love? But they do because God loved them first. And he loves you first. And that's how come you have love to begin with. A heart that is compassionate. Feeling sorry for people. Having tears when you hear about hurts that people are feeling. How many of you cried over your children when they were sick? You wish it was you instead of them. That's compassion. That's what we are to have as merciful people. A heart of giving. A heart of kindness. A heart of hope. A heart of love. A heart of gentleness. Treating people with gentleness. It says in Galatians that we're to lift each other's burdens and we're supposed to confront each other with gentleness and love. Mercy. Mercy is that peace that we receive from God. Mercy is that love, that, that mercy that God did for us at Jesus Christ. God had mercy on us and sent Jesus to the cross instead of us. He had mercy on us that put Jesus cross, Jesus Christ on the cross. His love kept him there. His grace gave it to us. Oh, how merciful God is on us. Doesn't give us what we deserve. Too many times we think that we, we're being wronged. God never wrongs us. He gives us what we don't deserve. He's full of grace. He's full of mercy. He doesn't give us what we deserve, but he gives us more than we deserve. This month has been Pastor Appreciation Month. I have received more blessings, and I don't deserve it. I'm just God's servant trying to do what God has called me to do and wants me to do. Thank you for your love, and I'm going to tell you that right now. It means more to me than you can imagine. There's times when I feel like maybe I should move on because you need to get somebody who, who will treat you more, be here and be there for you and love you. <coughs> but then when all this happens, I, I feel, you know, this is where God wants me to be. That's mercy. Mercy says, you're going to be there until I tell you. A heart of mercy. A humble heart. Philippians 2, 14 says, Do all things without grumbling and disputing. A humble heart is recognizing who I am and who God is. That will humble you. When I think that I, whenever I think I'm getting bigger than I should, all I have to do is look at God and realize, I don't know how to talk about physically getting bigger. I'm talking about getting bigger in my mind and my thoughts that I realize I only am who I am because God has made me who I am and that humbles me to recognize that I'm just one of his children. I don't do the things that when displeasing, the heart is an open to the leadership of God, a heart open to what he calls us to do, not what we want to do. He, you, when you pray, you pray for God's will to be done, not yours. And then I go back to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus says, Father, if it be your will, take this cup from me, but not my will, but your will be done. That's humble. That's a heart. Jesus humbled himself also in chapter 2 of Philippians, and I didn't write it down, but when he came from heaven, he humbled himself to become like us. He humbled himself to be like us so he could take our sin away. If he wasn't a man, he could not take our sin away. But he became a man. 
But he was fully God, fully man. He didn't leave his deity up in heaven. He left other things up in heaven. He was still God. But he was a man for us. Who came to die for us. He humbled himself all the way and was obedient all the way to the cross. Obedience. Humbleness is being obedient. Obedient when God says to do something that you really don't want to. The other day when Ronnie and Mom was in the hospital, I was sitting there thinking, you know, I don't want to go to the hospital. I don't like to go to the hospital. God said, I don't care what you like. You're going to the hospital. And guess where I ended up? At the hospital. Obedience brings joy. I felt wonderful when I was there. I have gone to nursing homes thinking, oh, God, I really don't want to go. And one day I was visiting Carla, and she made me feel so humble because she was setting tables for the people. She said, we got a lot of old people here <laughs> that can't do it on her own. So she gets out there and helps them. And I'm thinking, wow, what a humble heart. That's what I need. I need that humility. I need to be humbled at times. How about you? Don't you need to be humbled at times? That's what discipline from God does. It humbles you. Oh, it might hurt you a little bit, but it humbles you and makes you a better person. The heart of self-giving thinking more of the other person than yourself. That's love. That's agape love. That's what Jesus did. He thought more of us than his own life. And he put his own life on the cross for us. His blood was filled for us. We were so rebellious and so unworthy that it didn't bother him because he was giving of himself to us. The heart treats others better than they treat ourselves. I have been humbled a lot in the past few couple years. Doing nurse work is not my thing, Vicki, I'm sorry. But I've had to do nurse work for my, adult, my wife and for others. Humble. Humble yourself to help others. No matter what it's like. No matter what it smells like. What it looks like. Sometimes we have to humble ourselves to help the other person. Humble ourselves to realize that God wants us to have that humble heart. And he looks at our humble heart and sees if we are doing what we're supposed to do. And another one is a joyous heart. I think of God has to be laughing at us at times. When he looks at us, he must be shaking his head and said, Wow, how can this be? It reminds me of the story in Genesis. Where Sarah was in the tent. And Abraham was standing outside the tent talking to the three men. Talking to this and said, Ah, in a year I'm coming back and your wife's going to bear a son. And here's Sarah. Ha <laughs> ha, yeah, right. I'm past that age. That's not going to happen. Ha <laughs> ha. God knew she was laughing. God said, why are you laughing? When I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. When God purposes things, he gets it done. It's all right to laugh. I think we need more laughter in this world that we live in. I think we need more joy, more expression of joy. I love living with my life. I don't love this life, but I love my life. I love my life to the point that I want to be someone that says that somebody will smile at. 
That's why I make a, a promise to myself. When I go to Walmart, I'm going to smile at all those workers that aren't smiling. I know they're working hard. I remember when I used to work for a living when I was in construction work. And I'd come in on Monday smiling and feeling good and joyous and those old drunks who've been going all weekend and had a headache and said, how can you be that way? I said, I've got God and I don't feel the way you do. Joyous, smile once in a while. You know you use less muscle smiling than you do frowning. So we need to we need to have that joy in our heart. The joy that spreads to other people. And without joy, you cannot spread good news. You come up to say something, I have good news for you. I have Jesus. Do you? Oh, that's gonna really cheer them up. That's gonna bring them. And wow, I want that. You come with a joyful heart and say, you know, Jesus loves you. I don't care who you are, what you've been doing. Jesus loves you. Smile at him and say, hey, God just wants you to come to him. That's spreading good news. But you can't do it with a sour puss or sour heart or sour words. Joyful words. Bringing hope. A heart that is joyful is a thankful heart. We're coming into the season of Thanksgiving where I always say we need to have an attitude of gratitude. But when you have a joyous heart, you have a thankful heart. I am thankful for who I am. Oh, there have been times when I wish I was somebody else. I wish that was Kenny Boyer playing third base for the St. Louis Cardinals one time. I knew that had never happened, so I had to look at Yadier and say, I'll catch her. Because I'm bigger than a third baseman should be. But I, I, I wanted to be have a body like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Instead, I have a body like a, a bear. Did you know you, if you wrestle a bear, you'll never win because you can't pin their shoulders because they have long shoulders? I found that out wrestling a bear. <laughs> we, our, wrestling team, our wrestling team went to Valley Ford, brand new Ford company in Florida. And if you want, if you pin the bear, if you win the wrestling match with a bear, you get a new car. Yeah. But nobody knew that you couldn't pin a bear. And you never slap them, you never give them a bear hook because they're going to do what you're going to do. If you slap them, you're going to get. We had our lightweight wrestler, Tony Pertrosian. He slapped the bear, and the bear knocked him out of the ring. It's, of course, he had his claws all covered up. But you don't do that. And you can. We're here. We're all, all, all we, we can get this bear. And he'll go down. He'll go down. I mean, he's, he's a little heavier than you are. You're probably about five. He's probably about five or six hundred pounds. But he'll go down. And he'll let you get on top of him. And you push his shoulders and you can't put him down because he'll just roll over. And he'll, he'll get up. But you couldn't do it anyway. But that's. That's joy. When you do things that you don't expect to win, you just expect to have a good time. How many of you like to have a good time? I do. I like to have a good time. I'm a good time kind of guy. And in this world, we need some more good time. It was a good time meeting Keith this week. We didn't do anything but talk. We didn't jump up and down and slap everything and do that. We just talked and had a good time. You can joy, be joyful just being around family and loving them and talking, reminiscing. But most of all, give thanks. As Daryl's song said, I have a roof over my head, shoes on my feet, a table full of food. I'm thankful. Um, who I am, where I am, what I've got. Sometimes I get to 
discouraged in the little house that we have because we can't have anybody come into the living room our days were small. But you know what? I'm thankful we had that house. When we moved into that house, we had no mortgage. That's Thanksgiving when you retire. Don't have any mortgage. We moved in free. Free. Free of a mortgage. Joy, Thanksgiving. I'm thankful for food, but I'm also thankful for the fellowship around the food. I think maybe we need to get back to that in the church again sometime. Have more fellowship time around food. That's how Jesus had fellowship around the Last Supper with his, his disciples. And he had a lot, lot of things to tell them. The last thing, the last heart, <coughs> is a loving heart. Love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. Love God most of all. And if you don't love yourself, you will never love somebody else. looking for Proverbs where it says that. Proverbs eleven seventeen it says that if, if you don't care for your own soul, how can you care for somebody else? How can you love somebody if you don't love yourself? And I'm not talking about loving yourself unto death, as it says in Revelation. It says we didn't, we didn't defeat Satan by loving ourselves to death. Satan by loving ourselves and realizing that God's Jesus' blood was spilled for us and his word takes command. Thank you for God's word. A joyous heart, a heart filled with love. Loving God, loving each other. It's an unconditional love. We don't love just because we like you, we love unconditionally. You know, God loves us no matter where we're at, what we're doing, how bad we, we may look to others, God still loves us. And God still loves the whole world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not bury but have everlasting life. Amen? Amen. Look beyond the outside circumstances. Look at the love that people share. Openly serving God and serving others. That's a loving heart. A loving heart. Isn't it? So when God looks at you, how does he see you? How does he see you? Does he see a clean heart? Does he see a pure heart? Does he see a humble heart? Does he see a joyous heart? And most of all, does he see a loving heart? A heart that loves secure in him and not in self. If you haven't got that kind of life, that kind of heart, get it right with God today and say, here I am, God. Forgive me where I have stumbled in this area. Let me get back on track with you. God loves us. God loves us for who we are. And he looks inside and says, you're mine. And I'm thankful for that. His love says, I am yours. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the joy that you put in our hearts. But most of all, Lord, thank you for the love that you put in our hearts to cause us to be humble be pure and clean and before you in righteousness of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for being here with us today to help us through this time of service that we may go away from here having a better understanding of how you look at us and how we need to serve you and how we need to live for you. I pray, God, that 
Everyone here has that heart of love and forgiveness. A you know, heart that says, I belong to God and His love. If there's not, if they don't have that in their heart and their life, let them come today and receive you under themselves. Thank you, Jesus, for being here. And I thank you for all that you do in Jesus' name. We're going to stand and sing a hymn of invitation, one verse. Five fifty two.